Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chase Jarvis. Welcome to another episode of Chase Jarvis Live here on Creative Live. This is where I sit down with the world's top creatives, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders and do my best to unpack actionable and valuable insights to help you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today is Eve Barr. Hi, bud. How are well, you? I'm well. You had to walk from four blocks from you. you no, one way? block. One, one block. block. We're, we're on the other side of, of, of your building. Incredible studio space over there. It's beautiful, yeah. For uh, context, we're here in San Francisco. We are, there's like 50 things happening at once. We're doing this interview here. We're doing a bunch of stuff for Print Magazine. Um, working with Debbie Millman, who's a good friend of both of ours. Yes. And my phone's dinging in my pocket. Cardinal Sin there. Um, so for the people who know you, they probably know everything about you because you've had an illustrious career um, in design, industrial design. But for the folks that are new or new-ish, give a little backstory, give some context, how you got to where you're sitting right here. Sure. Uh, well, I'm an industrial designer, but I also believe in bringing all the different disciplines of the creative field. So uh, branding, which includes graphic design, packaging, digital, uh, which is user experience, um, on, you know, on device, UI, web apps, etc. cetera, um, all the disciplines of industrial design, and then strategy. And I've always believed that really the best designs are done when you blend all these dis disciplines together um, at the service of a big idea. So that's what Fuse is, you know, yes. Fuse Project, my company. It's um, where we fuse these different disciplines at the service of a big idea. Great, and give us a little backstory, classically trained, uh, Scandinavian descent. Give us give a little context here. <laughs> well, I grew up in Switzerland, okay. um, and I did about half of my studies in Switzerland, half um, in Pasadena at the Art Center. Got it. Um, amazing, yeah. amazing. And um, first project out of school that you found really deep meaning in that sort of sets you on the path that you're on now. First project out of school, I guess, I mean, I took an internship um, in the middle of the country. That was a big learning lesson at every level, you know, cultural and design-wise, um, with the largest manufacturer of furniture in the world. Um, you know, those were most sort of concepts about the future of working. And, but, but I was very early on very interested in that. And eventually that led um, to me having a... Um, sort of lifelong relationship with Herman Miller, mm -hmm. um, designing the sail chair, designing the uh, public office landscape, you know, office system, and a number of other projects with them. That, um, the fact that design in Europe, I feel like has been held in very high esteem for a long time, and it's been behind, I would say, uh, the US has been behind the European point of view, mm -hmm. or even you know, Asian influence. Um, what are, are there some particular um, milestones or things that have happened culturally, um, civically here mm -hmm. in the U.S. to to bring design. Is it the web? Is it like what, what? What's the combination of things that you feel like has put design where it is today in the U.S.? Well, I've seen a, a tremendous change. I, I got here, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, in the you know early mid '90s. Um, design was really not a factor in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. There were some good design firms, but when you looked at technology, um, you know, it wasn't something that people considered to be important at all. You know, it was all about engineering. Mm -hmm. It was all about um, the tech, you know. And yeah, manufacturing and silicon and like literally the- all, yeah, yeah, all of this. And um, design was secondary if it was, you know, anything really. Um, but that changed tremendously over a period of time where you know that mostly mirrored the uh, you know the the incredible success of Apple, and as Apple showed that you know design makes a difference. Design allows you to acquire customers, to build a brand, um, to create great experiences, great products at last. Um, everyone else realized how important it is to a point where now it's a 360 degree you know different type of environment we're in where. Uh, founders of many uh, tech companies are designers themselves, yep. where designers are sought after as uh, uh, parts of the management team, part of the advisory team. Um, you know, if you don't have design at the core of a startup here, um, you know, really 
you know, people will look at it like, like you're missing a part of what's going to be important for the business. Yeah, and to what end do you attribute? So beyond Apple, is there a, has there been cultural shifts outside of Silicon Valley, just um, like the, the accessibility of, you know, creative ideas? The, like, help me think a little bit broader. We talked, you know, Silicon Valley and your experience moving here to San Francisco, but what about as a larger cultural movement? What are some other key factors and how do you think that that plays into the future? Well, I think, I mean, I think the entire United States has become a lot more sophisticated about design in the last 20 years. In a way, we've rediscovered, you know, the best of American design as well. You know, yeah. Charles Eames, Ray Eames, Herman Miller, George Nelson. You know, they, people weren't, you know, uh, in the mainstream, we weren't, you know, looking at their work as much. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with the re-edition of their works, with the realization that this is, probably the best ambassadorship for the United States, you know, are these designers. I mean, you go anywhere in the world and Charles Eames and Ray Eames are revered, you yeah. know, their, their work is, is everywhere, yeah. um, in every company, in every museum, in every, uh, in, in, in many homes. And so um, we've realized that not only, you know, we have the rich history to be uh, a major force, a leading force in design, um, but we also practice it every day. And that, that, that has created a tremendous amount of education. Uh, so it went from you know, being a high-end type of practice um, to you know, seeing it at Target, seeing it um, that was in, a huge move, in, right, when in, Target shifted? Yeah. yeah, and that was like bringing it to mass culture? Exactly. I mean, seeing it in mainstream advertising, seeing design within reach everywhere. Um, and, you know, when you look at the, 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 the rise of the creative, you know, some creative press, you know, Dwell magazine, and, you know, Wired magazine, um, print you know, magazine. Mm -hmm, print, print magazine, magazine yeah. you know, like all these, um, you know, it, it's created awareness. Uh, and a culture around design, which I find very strong, very healthy. Um, in fact, we don't take it as as much for granted as, as as sometimes it's the case in Europe. So, so it's very, very vibrant, especially within the business community. Yeah, one of the things that I have um, seen is what what one of the things I believe, and I think I've seen through my travels all over the world. You travel a lot. I travel a lot. That what we have been so good at exporting is our culture. And originally it was films and, uh, and movies and celebrity, and now the fact that we have sort of a, not just Silicon Valley, but you know, design hubs like Silicon Valley, but New York, mm -hmm. um, LA. LA, incredible, like transformative ways that design has impacted both of those cities and the, a, a lot of others. I feel like we're exporting design now versus we had to sort of consume it for some time. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Do you feel like that is a, a product for us now? Well, I often say that, you know, the world appreciates our design more than they appreciate, um, you know, our foreign <laughs> policy. Um, so, and, and, oh, and, no, and, we shouldn't go there, but I'm tempted. <laughs> it's, but it is, it, it is true. I mean, uh, I think everyone recognizes the creativity the delight in the user experience of these products, the delight in the materials and manufacturing, uh, the design of them. Um, in many ways, you know, it is our best export, in my opinion. Um, and um, you know, it's it's. I think I think it's due to the fact that design looks at the world in a universal fashion. You know, we try to solve problems for people. Um, and we try to change their lives a little bit. You know, on an everyday basis, um, we try to create surprise moments and, and, and moments of delight. And that is a universal feeling. You know, yeah. it's a very exportable. It's a very, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the ROI on that is both cultural and, and, uh, and, and, and it's good business. Yeah, Sagmeister's a friend. He's been on this show. He, I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard his, yeah. seen his talk on beauty. Yes. Like he's got these cannons. They're beautifully sculpted right. killing machines. Right. And to have beauty in places where, you know, it, it seems like we went away from that. There was this horrible era. I don't know if we would just unify, I believe, call it the 80s, but when it just uh, was so absent. But to see it, you know, coming back, to see the accessibility to learning design, mm -hmm. um, obviously at Creative Live, that's a huge vision yeah. for us is to teach the world yeah. um, creativity. Well, I mean, uh, certainly the tools and the access to 
the tools of design have become um, much more available to everyone. Yeah. Uh, the learning around design has become more available. Designers have become more visible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go you go around San Francisco this weekend, the Fog Fair, for example, that mixes art and design, um, and there's there's a huge interest and appreciation. Uh, you know, in many ways because you know the web and 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 easy access um, and you know uh, obviously Creative Live is a part of that um, is is allowing people to to know more about it, to educate themselves, yeah. you know, to 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 seek you know, what it is about design that they can relate to, what makes it more personal to them. Um, and that's, that's a very big part of you know, how people make, cho make choices today in their lives. Yeah. Right? Now, speaking about personal, I think the folks at home, we can talk at the 30,000 foot level about design, but they want to know about you. Mm -hmm. So let's go out a little bit into your background. Sure. When did you first sort of acknowledge your own creativity? What, you know, talked a little bit about the childhood that you had and how it formed your career. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up in a in a um, you know in a wonderful household in a in a very sort of safe you know place country like Switzerland. Um, but my n no one in my family was in the creative fields. Um, there were no artists, designers, or architects. Um, so I but it's something that awoke in me when I was um, uh, in my early teens. Uh, I really decided to be a designer in, when I was maybe 14 or 15 years old. Wow. Um, but at the time, you know, Switzerland didn't really have uh, a great you know, school I could, I could imagine myself going to. My parents didn't know what industrial design was. Um, and you know, the access to you know, to 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 knowledge or to, you know to convince my parents that this was a good idea, you know, none of that was there. Yeah. I really had to um, to learn the basics and submit portfolios and find a school that would accept me. Eventually, a school outside of the country. Um, where did you, you know, go? When I got to Art Center College of okay. Design in okay. Pasadena, yeah. like it, it 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 took a lot more, um, you know persuasion on my part to prove it to myself that I could do it, to prove it to my entourage that this was uh, something worthwhile pursuing. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I consider myself lucky that I, that I found that direction and pursued it and probably got my 10,000 hours, you know, by, by my late teens. Yeah, there's a, uh, I, I don't know if this is cultural or where we would couch it, but the concept of, oh, you're gonna be a designer or a photographer, a filmmaker, Culturally, like, oh, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. um, how much of that did you face? And you, you talked about sort of selling in or convincing your entourage or your family. Mm -hmm. and that's the thing that there's sort of two um, sort of piles of people that we're talking to with this show and with the work that we're doing here. And that's the people who uh, who are who identify as creative and are going from say one or two or three to ten. That's their aspiration is to get great. And then there's the people who are curious, mm -hmm. and they're we're trying to get them to go from zero to one. So the the battles that you you know tell me a story about you having to I you know convince your friends, your peers, sure. your, that it was well, worthwhile. You know, I, I, I finished gymnasium in Switzerland, which is essentially the equivalent of junior college, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the path from there is straight to university. So you can go study economics, be a banker, or a lawyer, or a doctor. Um, that's the binary choice yeah. that I had. Very Swiss and, things. Yes, and to go from there to saying, no, I'm gonna step off this path, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to start drawing. You know, I'm going to go back to, you know, life drawing and things like this. Um, you know, was was a very strange, scary step because I ended up in a little school in my hometown, um, mostly with um, retirees. You know, who were going back to drawing, um, and to you know, high school dropouts who you know. That was sort of like the one activity they like to do. And I was right there in the middle trying to build a portfolio, trying to demonstrate my skills. So my skills, I wasn't one of these kids who, and I had many of those in my classroom who were great cartoonists right off the bat, mm -hmm. you know, who were, um, you know, who, who had a propensity for, um, for, for drawing and expressing themselves um, through the creative arts. I just, I just had to learn it. And it was really, scary and painful, you know, suddenly, you know, I had no idea where I was going to end up. But I, but I, 
you know, and, and it took a few years. I mean, this initial stage, you know, took a few months, but it took a few years until I would say I, I became very proficient with that. And years later, you know, when I, when I got my first jobs, um, I was a good draftsman. I could take what's in my head. I could take the creative ideas. I put I could put them on paper quickly. Put them in front of a of a of a client and immediately convince them that there's a there there. And that's the um, you know I think that's the you know the the uh, the force you know the power that you have as a designer. The ability to express something that nobody else can see unless unless you you, you put it on paper for them. Yeah, there's a, we're at a time in history where I'm, I'm professing the idea that it's the first time in history that it's actually more risky to pursue the safe path, mm -hmm. to do what your parents want you to do, to get the concept of going to school, get a good job, and live happily ever after is actually the biggest risk that we have. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. Reflect I mean, on we, that for me. This is so. So I grew up in Switzerland, which isn't known exactly for change, um, and and um, great roads. You know, at the at the time, you know, it wasn't known for change, and um, you know, I get here, and anyone you speak to, engineers, um, you know, venture capitalists, uh, business folks, designers, everybody, all they talk about is change. You know, all they talk about is their idea, the next idea. And what you find in a place like this is, is all that support for your idea, for new ideas. This is, I mean, this really kind of unlocked my brain. I mean, it, it, it really blew my mind the second I arrived here. And I was like, wow, I found a place where there's a sense of possibilities. You know, I'm, 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 I'm just starting but people are listening, yeah. and that's incredibly powerful. And, um, but, but if you're not in the change business, or if you're not in the, you know, into exchanging ideas about what could be different, what could be better, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a dangerous place to be here. Of course. Right? So, so, so there's a reversal of, I agree with your, with your assessment. Um, you know, when, when you hear San Francisco, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, um, um, you know, you can rewire your brain to be about about what's next. Yeah. Um, let's go into a couple of personal projects. Yeah. Or personal professional. I think that's one mm -hmm. of the things that I love. Um, I also talk about we're all hyphens. We all do so many things. I mean, you consider yourself, you know, an industrial designer, but under there you list four or five other things that like mm -hmm. you're an entrepreneur. You've you've built companies. You you have partnerships and. Mm -hmm. Um, talk a little bit about some of your favorite projects. I'll, I'll highlight Fuse, maybe one laptop for every child. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that you want to talk sure. about? Sure. Um, so, so, so Fuse project is about 16 years ago. I start um, a design company, and you know today we're 80 across so many different disciplines. Um, it's a tremendous sandbox, and and you know we're very lucky to work on you know sort of the the most interesting, the most groundbreaking, a lot of firsts, mm -hmm. you know, first, um, wearables. You, know, you know, first wearables, first uh, laptop that's, um, that's designed for, um, for, for children in the developing world, one laptop per child, you know, the first Herman Miller chair that's um, very affordable from a cost standpoint and is, you know, really presents a different way to uh, you know assemble a chair. You know, without a without a framing element around the the back, for example. So we're very you know I'm 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 very fortunate that this keeps happening. I mean, all the way till today, or a couple of days ago, where we launched you know uh, two projects for um, the aging population. You know, in AI and in um, sort of wearable technologies that. Um, that, that sort of keep them em engaged, and you know those are things that are unimaginable, you know, unless you, you know, uh, just months ago, right? Uh, yeah. So, so uh, you know, there's so many projects; it's it's hard to sort of uh, pinpoint um, one or two. But I would say, you know, I would say the one laptop per child, um, you know, the Jambox, um, you know, the the Herman Miller sale chair. Um, those all demonstrated that 
you can do breakthroughs with design and um, and, and, and these things can, can really change entire you know, industries. All right, this might be a challenge because many of the Swiss friends that I have beside you are reluctant to share struggles because the Swiss are very proud people. But between where you started and all of the success with Jawbone and Fuse mm. and One Laptop Per Child, there's, there has to be some grit, there has to be some struggle. Oh, lots of grit. I mean, for me, it's always been a question of survival. You know, all I had really um, when I got here is, you know, hopefully the ability to get a job, to start somewhere, yeah. to um, to work on things that I would that would be important enough that it um, that it supports you, you know, doing the next thing. Um, you know, when I first moved to San Francisco, I lived in a tenderloin for a couple of years. You know, on Market Street between sixth and seventh. You know. <laughs> For people who live here, you know, you know, this isn't um, an easy area to live in. Um, I mean, for me, it's always been, and I would say even today, um, it's always been about, um, you know, you 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 have to work hard and you have to enjoy it before your luck runs out. I mean, nothing's, <laughs> you know, in the creative fields, you you sometimes it feels like you're only as good as as your last, you know, project. Yeah. Um, and so, I, and I think. What's really so important is the fact that, you know, you really put your, your most, you know, the, 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 your passions, you know, your level of detailing, the quality into your work, that, that never stops. It's not, it's not that, that this gets easy at any given point, you know. It's always about making it a little better um, than anybody else thinks it should be. And so you constantly pushing, you're constantly struggling in a way. I mean, you're failing every day as a designer because, you know, you try to build this thing or that thing and, you know, you go through 20, 30, 100 iterations before it's good enough. So in a way, you, you know, failure and struggle, you have to embrace that. You have to be able to live with that in order to, um, to get to a place where, um, where you have something that's going to be, to be really strong. It's a core part of the process, I feel like. And if for those folks who just want the end, the outcome, not willing to put in the hard part, I think it's a message for you. <laughs> it's not going to go well. Um, so a couple of, it, it, I'm going to create a theoretical scenario here. There's someone who's building a company, and that company is going in a direction. They need to change that, that mm -hmm. company's direction. Um, and embracing design, companies may be reluctant to do it, but... Mm -hmm. They they know conceptually that boy that's a it's a differentiator it's a great lever. What would you tell the founder of that company, the president? Doesn't matter if this person's twenty or seventy. Like, sell the idea that design and creativity are foundations to what it is that they're making. Well, I think you know what I would you know what I would say is that um, you know design is going to accelerate you know the adoption of you know, new ideas. This is something that I often say. But if you're a new, if you're a company and you're trying to sort of reach a new place, uh, um, you know, you need to be able to internally uh, accept help. You know, accept support, accept um, um, you know designers as partners. And um, so, so what I would say is like, first of all, it takes time. It gets better every time. You can't just do it once. You know that's why that's why being partners makes so much sense because it's not like you're just going to design it once. You're going to keep designing. You know you're, you're going to keep designing it, making it better. There will be subsequent versions. Um, um, but what's critical is to set this process in the right way, to to get it on the right path with the right vision, with the right direction, and execute against that, and and then keep at it and. Um, you know, I, I, um, I never tell anyone it's easy. I never tell anyone it's um, something that just happens automatically or in, in, a, in a way that's painless. But in many ways, I also tell them, I don't know that you have another option. I mean, greatness is, you know, is, is, is um, the one thing we're given to pursue as human beings, right? And Design will, you know, will be um, will be a great part. Will be a partner in that. Uh, let's talk about you personally again. Uh, in your pursuit of greatness, are there some habits that you have on a daily basis? 
whether it's you know staying healthy, whether it's travel, seeing new things. What are some elements of your life that you feel like have helped translate into trying to make this somewhat actionable for some folks at home? And I don't want it, it's not like well, eat, I think take I think certainly vitamins. you know it is it is like a I mean it is like a, a sport. I mean design is like a sport. You have to be able to sort of come back at a problem on a regular basis. You have to sort of let your brain, you know, run with it, you know, at night when you're out and about, when, you know, when you're at work. But, you know, all, you have to sort of take these uh, challenges, you know, with you. And that means you have to be comfortable with that. You have to be healthy. You have to be um, positive thinking. That's yeah. really important. You know, it's really easy when you don't get to a solution fast enough to beat yourself down. So, um, you know, having some, some, some tolerance for yourself and, and, um, and, and um, you know, being cognizant of the fact that, you know, what, what you're doing isn't easy. So, is, you know, I think, I think it's hard to be a creative. I mean, I think, you know, you constantly can see the shortcomings. I mean, this is what a, being a creative is. It's you're an editor, you're a cre critic, and, you know, you do that for yourself as you do it for the rest of the world. And, um, you know, give, to, give, yeah. give yourself some love, give yourself <laughs> some patience. Um, find ways to kind of relax while, you know, in the background, your brain is always churning. What's an example for you personally? You're going for me, skiing, uh, for it's, me it's easy. It's, it's like awesome. surfing. It's like skiing. Um, you know, these activities, activities where really your mind can be somewhere else. You know, if you, if you, it's impossible when you're in the water, you know, uh, looking at the horizon, looking at waves coming, um, you know, coming towards you. There's no other thought that can enter your mind. Um, you know, the, the focus is immediate. It's a very zen in a sense. Um, so finding what, you know, makes you zen or takes your, uh, your mind, calms your mind, uh, helps you focus on something else for a bit is actually quite useful. I think the brain needs that type of balance. Um, advice for young designers, uh, you know, you, you uh, I've, we've had dinner several times before, yeah. I'm, I've heard you talk in other instances being somewhat hesitant to give advice, but I'm, I'm like, how, how would you? I don't think I'm hesitant to give, give advice. Uh, what I do recognize is that every designer is quite different, and that's the beauty of our, our of our profession. Um, you know, the, the, the diversity of the way design is uh, practiced, um, the diversity of applications of our work is so vast that it means that we are, you know, we, we're a wide-ranging group. Um, you know, the, the one thing I would say for young designers is um, there's a lot of pressure to be two things as a designer. There's a lot of pressure to be a generalist, to be somebody who can be good at a lot of different things and um, um, just because people always, you know, if you tell them about design, they'll tell you about marketing. If you tell them about design, they'll tell you about engineering. If you talk to them about engineering, they'll t talk, they'll, they'll say, well, what about your design, right? So you have to, there's a lot of pressure to know everything and to be everything. At the same time, to be a great designer, I believe you have to, you have to have very, very core knowledge. You have to be really, really good at one thing. Um, so I would start with that. I would start with being really good at one thing, um, at one craft, uh, one, ac one activity of design. And what you'll see happening is when you're good at one thing, people will start opening up and asking you questions and asking you to participate and be a part of the other parts of design. Um, when you're a generalist, um, that is harder to make happen. Yeah. Um, and so we tend to hire people who are incredible at what they do. And then, you know, they love the fact that they're starting to learn from others. They're starting to participate to the entire process uh, because of the environment they're in and because there is a lot of respect for, for, for what they bring to the table. Yeah, when you start, when you focus on learning one thing and putting in, you already referenced 10,000 hours or, um, uh, I'll say mastery, when you master one aspect of design, my sense and the sense that we talk about around here at Creative Live and my personal experience is if you can become world class at one thing, in part what you're doing is learning how to learn. Mm -hmm. And once you can deconstruct, oh my gosh, this is how I really went deep here, 
A, you have a different peer set because your peers are the best at their things, at their relative disciplines. You learned what got you to be great at yours, and you put those two things together, learning how to learn and the fact that your comrades are the best you know, um, engineers or the best. Right. Um, you need to have good comrades to go into battle with, that's for sure. So true, so true. <laughs> Community is critical. Um, last question sure. is if you had uh, something written on your wall that you had to look at every day, maybe you, know, you wake up, you sit up in your bedroom, across from your bed is a phrase or saying or a concept. Come after me with what that, what that would be. Well, there's a few things that I'm that I'm that I sort of always get inspired by or try to try to bring back. I mean, one of them is um, about design intent and how you know design is um, is really the sort of the first manifestation of human intent. Um, you know, what is the intent of this company, of this project, of this venture, um, of this design? You know, where how how it is that you're putting yourself out in the world, what is a message that comes across this activity that you're doing? I think, I think start, if you start with intent, um, it really helps you refine um, and edit in a way, kind of get rid of the extraneous uh, stuff, um, you know, edit the why and the how you're going to do this design. Um, this is derived from, from you know, Bill McDonough, who also talks a lot about intent when it comes to um, the environment and sustainability. Yeah. Um, the other one is, is you know, is similar, but it's a, it's a catchphrase, which is be good and work hard. Um, you know, there's no, there's no room for so-called talent, in my opinion, in design. Um, I, I, the thing I, I, I don't like to hear, you know, is people recommending someone by saying, you know, oh, he has a lot of talent. Um, I don't know what that means, right? It's like, it's like I wasn't a good draftsman, but I worked re I had zero talent for it, but I worked hard and I, you know, I, I, I succeeded at, at being good at that craft. Um, um, that's, um, I think that's important to realize in design. So, so many people think that you're a designer because you were born with it or you have a talent of some sort, you know, that other people don't have. Um, and it's not true for me and it's not true for the incredible team that I have and how successful and how far they've all come you know, in their own careers. Um, they just all work incredibly hard. Yeah, creativity is inside of every person and it's sort of the manifestation and the amount of hard work that you put into extracting that. Do you mm -hmm. want it bad enough that you're willing to pull that creativity? Because we have a culture, face it, that sort of represses it. Art's one of the first things that gets cut in, cut in school. Mm -hmm. you know, we like to think it's changing. But fundamentally, we are the ones who either like bring out or repress the creativity that's in us. And uh, I want to thank you for being on the show. You're a shining that's example great. of it. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Very Fun much. Fun to be here. And I, I don't want to get between you and going to Tahoe. Sounds like I might find my way to your suitcase here pretty quick if I can. Well, someday we should. Thanks a lot. <laughs> appreciate it. Buddy. Thank you.